What's up, you beautiful bastards? Welcome back to the Thursday Philip DeFranco Show, and you know, let's just jump into it. First up today in an update slash uh, super messy will they, won't they entertainment news, uh, we had frenemies popping back into headlines. Right on one side, you have Trisha Paytas. On the other, Ethan Klein, former co-host of the massively successful podcast. About a week ago, that podcast imploded uh, without just going back into it and re-litigating everything. It was just, I'll just summarize it as it was a, a complete mess. I don't want to get an argument over I really like, need your to most... leave. Okay, all right, we're done. Thank okay. you, guys. Guys. Thank you. And then, uh, despite the situation seemingly getting worse and worse and being more divided than ever, we saw Trisha Paytas respond to a tweet seemingly saying, uh, I'm coming back to the show next Tuesday. So we had a lot of kind of just bystanders and fans going, how is this possible? They seem so uh, divided. And uh, Ethan Klein then responded well, on Twitter and TikTok saying, no, that is not actually happening. And really, as far as my opinion, and, and you can, I think you can use this in a more general sense, because I don't believe that this is fake or orchestrated for like views or relevance or anything like that. I don't know how you can justify that podcast ever coming back together. Like when you try to do something and it repeatedly results in a toxic outcome, and then you try it again and you toxic outcome, at what, at what amount of money or views or relevance do you go, yeah, it's worth it. And if I'm in Ethan Klein's shoes, right, the, the other podcasts still do relatively well. You got Teddy Fresh, Macon Bank, you got more kids on the way, a looming lawsuit. Like, how much chaos do you need in your life? And I say it's kind of a more general thing because I, I think that's a question that a lot of us need to ask ourselves. A lot of us, like, we repeat the same things and we're surprised that we get the same outcome. And, like, on the journey inward, we have to go, like, is it because I, I feel like I need chaos in my life so there's an excuse? Or do I, do I like, secretly crave the, the drama and stress of it? Or, like, why? <laughs> I don't know. I'll take sanity over, over views and money any day. And then, in interesting business news, we should talk about Victoria's Secret because right now they are trying to rebrand, with them notably phasing out their famous angels and replacing them with a campaign called Victoria's Secret Collective, with them saying that the campaign will involve a series of new spokespeople that the company described as extraordinary partners with their unique backgrounds, interests, and passions. And among those partners, I mean, you have everyone from a uh, Priyanka Chopra to a uh, Megan Rapinoe. Reportedly, in addition to the women appearing in the advertising for the company, they'll also advise the brand on its messaging. And, you know, this does mark a major change for the company, which has become very well well known for these tall, thin models, some saying they have unachievable body types. Or one of the biggest criticisms being that the, the company really only catered to a male's fantasy ideal of sexy. With the company's chief executive even telling the Times, when the world was changing, we were too slow to respond. We needed to stop being about what men want and to be about what women want. And notably, this change also comes after the last couple of years where the company's been tied to scandal after scandal. Right, things like uh, the former chief executive was closely tied to Jeffrey Epstein. Also, a report came out that found high-powered men at the company ran it with a culture of misogyny and harassment. But yeah, ultimately we're gonna have to wait to see if this shift pans out. And I mean, it's been interesting to see public reaction. It is kind of what I would expect. Some seemingly happy that the, the goal here seems to be uh, more women for, to be more inclusive. But at the same time, you have people saying, this seems like a company that's just going woke. And so actually, I mean, since that debate is happening, I do want to pass the question off to you. Well, what are your feelings when you hear about this story? Then, in, in kind of a related story, because it relates to female bodies and media, we had Scarlett Johansson in the news. And she's been doing press, promoting the upcoming Black Widow, film, and in an interview this week with Collider, she reflected how on she and the character have changed over the years, and specifically criticizing how her character Natasha was hypersexualized in Iron Man 2, saying, I mean, you look back at Iron Man 2, and while it was really fun and had a lot of great moments in it, the character is so sexualized, you know? Really talked about like she's a piece of something, like a possession or a thing or whatever, like a piece of ass, really. Also, adding that at one point, Tony Stark says, I want some about her character, and noting that while at the time she may have, you know, somehow processed that as a compliment, her understanding and a lot of women's understanding of self-worth has changed. Saying now people, young girls, are getting a much more positive message. But it's been incredible to be a part of that shift and be able to come out the other side and be a part of that old story, but also progress, evolve. I think it's pretty cool. And regarding the Black Widow movie, it's coming out in just a few weeks and early responses so far are rather good. So it's gonna be exciting to see how that goes. But from that, I wanna take a quick second to thank the sponsor of today's show, Raycon. Co-founded by audio engineers and some of the music industry's elite, Raycon is disrupting the electronics industry by designing premium wireless audio for half the price without compromise while prioritizing their customer experience from start to finish. And Raycon wireless earbuds are the best way to bring your favorite content with you wherever you go. I personally use mine, uh, whether I'm just, you know, walking around, listening to podcasts, uh, when I'm on a Zoom call, that could have just been an email, Greg. But yeah, pretty much all the time I have headphones in my ears, I'm listening to something, which uh, speaking of, I do need some new music suggestions, so let me know in the comments down below. And not only do they look amazing, they're comfortable, sound great, and most importantly, they have a minimalist design. Six hours of playing time, seamless Bluetooth, 
pairing, more bass, and they're extremely compact, making for a comfortable noise isolating fit. And best of all, right now, Raycon is offering you 15% off just for you. So just click that link down below in the description, buyraycon.com slash Franco to get 15% off your order today. And don't forget, they have a 45 day free return policy. So what are you waiting for? Then in big money, business and jobs news, we have the Federal Reserve predicting now that inflation will rise faster than expected and saying that it plans to move up its timeline for interest rate hikes by a year from 2024 to 2023. Like previously predicting that inflation would rise 2.4% this year, but now expecting a 3.4% jump. With Fed Chair Jerome Powell warning yesterday, shifts in demand can be large and rapid. Inflation could turn out to be higher and more persistent than we expect. With Powell adding that the central bank would be keeping a close eye on inflation and that it would respond quickly if inflation becomes broader or more persistent than current estimates. Now with this, you have some Republican lawmakers such as Senator Rick Scott of Florida saying, hey, interest rates need to go up sooner to prevent inflation from rising to dangerous levels. However, Treasury Secretary Yellen argued that the situation is being monitored very, very carefully and that prices are rising, yes, but they're also moving back toward normal levels. But also overall taking everything into account, the Fed's projections have been interpreted as largely optimistic, especially since it now expects economic growth to hit 7% this year, which is up from the previous expectation of 6.5%. With them also believing that the unemployment rate could fall back to pre-pandemic levels by 2023. Which, I mean, if you take into account how damaging the last 15 months have been, that's still really fast. But ultimately we have to wait and see, right? It's the key word here, predictions, educated guesses. <laughs> then you have the education department announcing yesterday that they have canceled about $500 million worth of federal student loans for roughly 18,000 students who were defrauded by the now defunct ITT Technical Institute. Right? And for some context here, ITT Tech was shut down back in 2016 after it was found to have misled students about employment prospects and whether credits would transfer to other schools. And while this left a lot of people in a bad place, the, the loans of the selected students will be 100% forgiven under a borrower defense program, which provides loan forgiveness to students who can prove that they were defrauded by their colleges. Right? Notably, this comes as part of a broader effort by the Education Department under Biden to chip away at the massive backlog of claims in the borrower defense program that piled up during the Trump administration, which refused to provide loan forgiveness to defrauded students during the first few years in office, and then began granting partial relief under a controversial policy in 2019. So with this, back in March, the Education Department rolled back that policy and cleared $1 billion in federal student debt for 72 2,000 borrowers from for-profit colleges who were granted partial cancellations under Trump, but instead provided them with full discharges. But still, even there, according to reports, there are tens of thousands of people waiting for a decision on their claims. So that's why with this, we saw many people applauding the decision, but also arguing that more needs to be done. Like the vice president of the legal group, Student Defense, telling reporters, it appears the Biden administration genuinely wants to help people who are owed discharges. But that makes it all the more confounding that they are so hesitant to use their authority to immediately and automatically help the countless additional borrowers who are still waiting. Then we have the Supreme Court in the news in part because this morning they struck down the third Republican-led challenge to the Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare, to reach the high court. But the main issue at hand being the provision of the law that requires people to either purchase health insurance or pay a tax penalty, often known as the individual mandate. It's easily one of the most controversial parts of Obamacare. It's been before the Supreme Court before, which upheld a provision back in 2012 on the grounds that it amounted to a tax and thus fell under the Congress's taxing power. But then in 2017, the Republican-held Congress pulled a stunt that was, I mean, honestly very smart. As a part of their sweeping tax bill, the GOP set the penalty for not having health care to zero dollars. And so, as a result, a group of Republican-led states headed by Texas sued, arguing that because their Republican buddies made the mandate zero dollars, it no longer raised revenues and could not be considered a tax, thus making it unconstitutional. And, and this is a key part here, the states also argued that the individual mandate is such a key part of Obamacare that it couldn't be separated from the law without getting rid of the whole thing. In other words, the GOP claimed that by zeroing out the mandate, they rendered the entire ACA unconstitutional. But in their decision today, the Supreme Court rejected that argument in a 7-2 to two decision with Justices Samuel Alito and Neil Gorsuch dissenting. And in the majority decision, Justice Stephen Breyer wrote that the Republican states had no grounds to sue because they could not show how they were harmed by their own colleagues zeroing out the penalty, writing, there is no possible government action that is causally connected to the plaintiff's injury, the cost of purchasing health insurance. And adding that the states have not demonstrated that an unenforceable mandate will cause their residents to enroll in valuable benefits programs that they would otherwise forego. Right? And so so with this, we, we saw the anticipated responses. Many Democrats cheering the move, Republicans condemning it. And I mean, despite that being the expected response, this decision is really significant for two reasons. First of all, it keeps Obamacare as the law of the land, ensuring that roughly 20 million people enrolled still have health insurance. And secondly, as Axios points out, it also shows where there are some limits on how much the Republican agenda can actually be accomplished through the courts, even with a solid conservative majority. And kind of interestingly, today's decision actually marked the largest margin of victory of all the three challenges to the ACA. And ultimately with this story, or honestly, anything else 
also stood out to you today. I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because this is a conversation and also the end of today's show. As always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribe, and all the good stuff that helps the show out. And of course, as always, my name is Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you next time.